Take a look outside a window. What is the season where you are? How do you know? Most likely, you looked at a tree or plant and noticed details about its leaves and assessed the qualities of sunlight streaming outside. Observing the timing of biological events in relation to changes in season and climate is called phenology. When you notice the daffodil buds are poking through the snow and think spring is on its way, you're using phenology. When you see leaves turn from green to red and watch migrating birds fly past and realize that summer is over, autumn is here, you're using phenology. Literally meaning, the science of appearance, phenology comes from the Greek words pheno, to show or appear, and logos, to study. Humans have relied on phenology since the time of hunters and gatherers. We've watched changes in seasons to know when to plant and harvest food and when to track migrating animals. Scientists observe and document seasonal changes in nature and look for patterns in the timing of seasonal events. Timing of these natural signs has remained consistent until recently. Increasing global temperature is causing rhythms of nature to shift. Bud burst, the day when a tree or plant's leaf or flower buds open, is occurring earlier in the year, for some species. It's rare to find an adult who actively still wonders what their parents think. But that isn't to say that we aren't wondering about our value in more general terms. It's just that we may without noticing, have taken the question somewhere else and very often, to particularly harsh modern figures of authority, media and social media. To this pitiless arena, the self-doubting person now directs all their fears of unworthiness and panicked desire for reassurance. To a system set up to reward sadism and malice, they constantly raise their phones and implicitly ask, Do I deserve to exist? Am okay? Am beautiful or respectable enough? And, because social media is built on the troubles of the individual soul, the verdict is never a reliable yes. One is never done with cycles of fear and reassurance seeking. Every time their spirits sink, which is often, the self-doubting sufferer picks up their phone and begs to know whether they have permission to go on. If this might be us, we should grow curious about, and jealous of, people who are free. They are so because someone long ago settled the question of what they were worth and the answer has seemed solid ever since. Social media is a roar in the next valley, not a mob in their own mind. Learning from these calm souls won't just involve deleting a few apps, we will have to go further upstream, back to the baby self, whose alarmed inquiries we must quiet once and for all with ample doses of soothing, until now absent kindness. The result of the scientific research shows that all metals respond to the heat. In recent years, people used to think that metal is supposed to blend under the heat, but sometimes it doesn't behave, so because atoms in the metal have random processes. The heat can accelerate the processes, but won't change the essence of random, so it could violate what we used to think. Hydration heat characteristics of blended cement containing up to 50% steel slag were studied at 25 A degree C. 45A degree C, and 60A degree C, by isothermal calorimeter. Kinetics equations were used to explore kinetics of blended cement. Kinetics parameters, N, K, and E, A, were calculated and analyzed. Results indicated that the activity of steel slag was very low.
volunteers in scientific studies sometimes get compensated. The payment can be cash, a gift card, or something almost worthless, it's amazing what people will do for a lollipop when they've had a few drinks. Simon Moore is a professor of public health research at Cardiff University in the UK. And the lollipops were for people who agreed to blow into a breathalyzer, while out on a Friday or Saturday night in Wales more than 1,800 people agreed to the exchange. And the scores covered a wide range of alcohol intake. So that would go from zero upwards. I think one of the largest scores we had was 120, which is a near-death experience. The researchers also gave a subset of volunteers a short survey about drinking habits and health risks. Questions like, how drunk are you right now? And how extreme has your drinking been tonight? And they found that even very drunk respondents felt relatively more sober if they were surrounded by even drunker people. In other words, our perception of intoxication and its risks is relative. So this is the point, as you change context, perceptions will change, although the absolute level of alcohol in their system doesn't change. The study is in the journal BMC Public Health More says one way to use this finding is for better city zoning. In the United Kingdom, for example, there's been a big push to put more premises that sell alcohol in the same district, in the same area. A lot of people in the United States are coffee drinkers. Over the last few years, a trend has been developing to introduce premium specially blended coffees known as gourmet coffees into the America market. Boston seems to have been the birthplace of this trend. In fact, major gourmet coffee merchants from other cities like Seattle, San Francisco, came to Boston where today they are engaged in a kind of coffee war with Boston's merchants. They are all competing for a significant share of the gourmet coffee market. Surprisingly the competition among these leading gourmet coffee businesses will not hurt any of them. Experts predict that the gourmet coffee market in the United States is growing and will continue to grow to the point that gourmet coffee will soon capture a half of what is now a $1.5 million market and will be an $8 million market by 1999. Studies have shown that coffee drinkers who convert to gourmet coffee seldom go back to the regular brands found in supermarkets. There is no denying that the concept of family has certainly changed in American society over the last few decades. Statistics continue to show that fewer Americans are getting married, and those who do so are having fewer children or none at all. More marriages are ending in divorce. More people are living alone, cohabiting with someone, or marrying more than once in a lifetime and creating stepfamilies. Traditional families once dominated every neighborhood. A traditional family consists of a husband and wife, plus their children, whether biological or adopted. If they have any today, American society displays greater diversity, and many American households can be considered non-traditional under this definition. Family structures that may be considered non-traditional or alternative include single parenthood, cohabitation, same-sex families, and polygamy. 
Let's take a brief look at each of these. Single parenthood was fairly common prior to the 20th century due to the more frequent deaths of spouses. But at that time, there was a certain stigma surrounding being a single parent. Today, single parenthood is considered more acceptable. One parent families may still result from the death of a significant other, but now also come about through circumstances, including a parent's choice or divorce. Cohabitation is the sharing of a household by an unmarried couple. But you can see from the relatively crooked and narrow streets of the city of Rome as they look from above today, you can see that again, the city grew in a fairly ad hoc way, as I mentioned. It wasn't planned all at once. It just grew up over time, beginning in the 8th century BC. Now this is interesting. Because what we know about the Romans is when they were left to their own devices, and they could build the city from scratch, they didn't let it grow in an ad hoc way. They, they structured it in a, in a very care, dash, very methodical way, that was basically based on military strategy, military planning. The Romans they couldn't have conquered the world without obviously having a masterful military enterprise. And they everywhere they went on their various campaigns, their various military campaigns. I have said before that you can't have a civilization that doesn't have art. When we think about the great civilizations historically, all of them had great production of culture and art. Because a society has to be able to observe itself. And the sophistication of the great civilizations were their ability to look at themselves and what allows a society to do that are the producers of art and culture mirror back. To the core of the society. Exactly what is being produced at that moment how people are thinking of themselves and how individuals are relating to the social structure at that time. Art is the vehicle through which we understand that. Were you to take away art? What would be that mirror? How would we see what we are about? Okay. So this is the big benefit of a universal philosophy. It says it applies to everybody. Well, looks that doesn't, you know, 205 or 206 countries in the world. And you've got something that applies to everybody. That's a bit strange, isn't it? No, says liberal theory. There are same value structures that apply to all of us. You couldn't have the United Nations without it. It couldn't tell you that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights without this idea of values that apply to all of us just because we are humans. Now, the idea is to test that as well. Why is sport universal? Why does everybody play football? It's because the values are specified at a very thin level at the top. There are these rules, and we all have to abide by just these rules. But there are lots of things about football that aren't rules specified. The history of software is of course very very new. And the whole IT industry is really only 67 years old which is extraordinary and to be so close to the birth of a major new technology, a major new discipline is quite remarkable given where we got to in those 67 years. And the progression has been not so much a progression as a stampede because Moore's Law, the rapid expansion in the power of computing and the rapid fall of the cost of computing and storage and communications has made it feasible for information technology to move into all sorts of areas of life that were never originally envisaged. 
What has happened is that there has been as I said a stampede for people to pick the low-hanging fruit. Let's say if I'm asking which source do you often use to get information? Newspaper? Radio? And the survey shows 62% of the people chose internet. You might be thinking I am going to say how important the internet is, or how quickly it has changed the world for a few years. But what if I tell you this survey is conducted on the website global and mail.com? Our answer will be different. Because the people who did this survey on a website must be frequent users of internet. This sample is a biased sample. So we have to pay attention to how a survey is conducted. Jeannie spent the first 13 years of her life locked away in a small bedroom in her parents' home. In 1970, her parents were charged with child abuse and Jeannie began rehabilitation with a team of psychologists and linguists. And scientists were using her experiences to answer the following question, if a person is deprived of language throughout their childhood, can they ever learn enough to be able to communicate well? At first, the answer appeared to be yes. Jeannie quickly began to learn new words for the objects around her and even say phrases with two or three words similar to how toddlers speak. However, from there, her ability to communicate verbally plateaued. This is because she could not learn grammar, which linguist Noam Chomsky believes separates human language from the communication of animals. It appeared that Jeannie had passed the critical period of learning human language, which is thought to end around puberty. Scientists have hypothesized that, after a restricted developmental period where the nervous system is particularly sensitive to the effects of a certain experience, in this case, language, it is nearly impossible to learn it. And the same effects have also been shown when learning sign language after the critical period. Now you're probably wondering why there is a critical period in the first place. According to Eric Leneberg, the linguist who popularized the critical period hypothesis, the function of language tends to settle in the left hemisphere of the brain after the critical period. And it's thought that the brain loses some of its plasticity after this lateralization. So, if you haven't learned language until after this point, it may be harder for your brain to learn the new material. And sadly for Jeannie, she was already past that point. However, while Jeannie would never be able to effectively use language, she was able to quickly learn other things, such as how to use the toilet and dress herself. So maybe you're on vacation, you're in Athens for the first time. During the day you're experiencing a bunch of new events and new sights and sounds, and as it's going by that as prospectively it seems to be flying by. In retrospect however, maybe the next day or you're back from vacation looking back upon that, it seems to be a long day. So retrospectively, it seems that it was an extended period of time. And this is something that was pointed out as far back as William James and his principles of neuroscience over a hundred years ago, and the point is that retrospectively we're not so much telling time, but we're rebuilding or estimating how much time has elapsed based on the number of experiences we have in memory. So retrospectively you're more estimating how much time has elapsed, if there was a period full of new memories then you're left with the impression that it was a long period of time retrospectively.
Most of the world's ecosystems are the result of millennia of coevolution by organisms, adapting to their environment and each other until a stable balance is reached. Healthy ecosystems maintain this balance via limiting factors, environmental conditions that restrict the size or range of a species. These include things like natural geography and climate, food availability, and the presence or absence of predators. For example, plant growth depends on levels of sunlight and soil nutrients. The amount of edible plants affects the population of herbivores, which in turn impacts the carnivores that feed on them. And a healthy predator population keeps the herbivores from becoming too numerous and devouring all the plants.